our third session. And remember, after this is over, there will be a, a, a brief break, but then we have the Eucharist. Today is St. Bartholomew's Day, and we do want to remember St. Bartholomew, whose name actually wasn't Bartholomew. But I'll more about that later. Okay. Now what we want to do in this third session is to look at some of the documents that have to do with the Catholicity of the Church. And the first of those I want to look at are the 39 Articles of Religion. Oh, those are Protestant, aren't they? No, they're not. The trouble is, the 39 Articles have to be interpreted in the light in which the authors intended them, and that often doesn't happen. That people read the articles from the point of view they want, not what the authors intended. I'm going to give you some examples of that, but I want to deal with one in particular. Um, uh, Article 28 of the Lord's Supper. And I want to read one of those, there are two things here that are deeply misunderstood. And the first is the last paragraph of Article 28. It says, The sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance reserved, carried about, lifted up, or worshipped. And there are a lot of people that say, well, according to the articles of religion, you can't reserve the blessed sacrament, even though it is reserved here in the church. And you certainly can't lift it up or carry it about in procession because it says you can't. That's not what it says at all. This particular article was written by Bishop John Guest uh, in the 16th century. And he wrote it. And he was asked that last paragraph, what does that mean? He says, it means what it says. The sacrament was instituted to be received and consumed. That's why Jesus gave it to us. We would eat of this bread, drink of this cup. So we're saying it wasn't instituted for these other things. It doesn't say you can't do it. Yes, you can reserve the sacrament. The prayer book provides for it. And the author of, of this article says, yes, you can reserve the sacrament. Yes, you can carry it about in procession. Yes, you can give adoration to the Blessed Sacrament as the body and blood of Christ. These things you can do, but the purpose for which it was instituted was to be received and consumed. But that article, you see, was misunderstood. Another paragraph in that same article, which is subject to misunderstanding, is the one that says transubstantiation or the change of the substance of bread and wine in the supper of the Lord cannot be proved by holy writ. It's repugnant to the plain word of Scripture. It overthrows the nature of the sacrament and has given occasion to many superstitions. The interesting thing is that Roman Catholics said, well, you reject what we understand the Eucharist to be because you reject transubstantiation. And the Anglicans say, you overthrow the nature of a sacrament when you say the very substance has changed. In the 20th century, Anglicans and Roman Catholics came together in a series of international dialogues, the Anglican-Roman Catholic International Confrontation. And one of those first series of dialogues dealt with the question of the Holy Eucharist. And the interesting thing is, there was the centers of fighting for transubstantiation. And finally, the chairman who was directing that consultation said to the Anglicans and Roman Catholics alike, okay, I want you to write in 20th century English what you understand about the Eucharist and what happens in the consecration. Don't use terms like transubstantiation or real presence or anything like that. Put it in plain, old, simple English language. What do you understand? And the interesting thing was that when the two sides came together to read what they had come up with, it was 
identical. They were saying exactly the same thing. And then someone sat down and figured out that word transubstantiation has two entirely different meanings. Because what do we mean by substance? Transubstantiation literally is in English the Latin for change of substance. The substance is changed. Now, what some people understood by that was that on the Roman Catholic side, you're saying that the bread becomes flesh and the wine becomes blood. It ceases to be that. And we know that's not true. Well, that's not actually what the Roman Catholic Church was saying. The word substance, you see, and we're, we're dealing here now with philosophic terms, uh, the substance is the ultimate reality of something. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Oops. What is this? Okay. What is its substance? Paper. No. Its substance is the value of a dollar in the U.S. Treasury. This is a symbol of that substance. The trouble is that we're talking about physical properties, and if we're getting into Thomistic uh, philosophy and everything, substance is the ultimate reality. The physical properties are its accidents. And the trouble is that when the word transubstantiation is used, if you do not understand it in Thomistic terms, you will miss the point of what is being said. Transubstantiation in that sense of the word says the bread remains bread in its physical attributes. The wine remains wine in its physical attributes. But its ultimate reality, its real substance, is that it ceases to be breadness and becomes fleshness. And the wine ceases to be wineness and becomes bloodness. The ultimate reality is changed. And once you say that, then if what you're saying is the same thing whether Anglican or Roman. We believe that the bread remains molecularly bread and the wine remains molecularly wine. But its ultimate reality is now the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ. It is what our Lord said it was. This is my body. This is my blood. So this article of religion is condemning the, actually what it is condemning is what most people understood transubstantiation to say, which of course is not what it's saying. And so at that point, after 500 years of controversy, the Anglicans and the Romans were finally able to say, you know, we believe exactly the same thing about the sacrament. We're just using one word in two different meanings. And, and, and that can happen in language. You know, words do have different meanings. It's like when we were talking earlier this morning about in the Eucharist, we talk about do this for the remembrance of me. And that word remember to most of us usually means to think about it. But actually what it means is to put back together what has been dismembered. Bring me back to you for my remembrance. So that's the same thing here. So when you look at the articles of religion, you have to be very careful to say, what is actually being said and what is being condemned here is the idea of the substance being changed if you mean by the substance the physical properties. But if you mean by the substance the ultimate reality, yes, that is changed because that is where we have our problems. And we look at the articles of religion and I'm not going to go through all 39 of them. We don't have two or three days here. But, but I just want to share with you something. Back in 1991, I was on sabbatical. And I spent a good part of the summer 
uh, as a student in Robinson College at Cambridge University, primarily reading everything Cambridge had on the Articles of Religion. This is a 12-page bibliography. <laughs> and then after I finished all of those readings and everything, I went to St. Daniel's Library in uh, Wales and spent a week there figuring, well, obviously, Cambridge has got everything. This was just a duplicate. St. Daniel's had stuff that even Cambridge didn't have on the Articles of Religion. So when I finished all of this, it was, what is interesting is that the conclusion, and these authors of these books date back to the time of, of, of the Articles themselves. And they're written not just by Anglicans, but by Roman Catholics as well. And by some Protestants. But when you look at what is being said in all of these people, all these authorities, the interesting thing is that the vast majority, 80 some odd percent of them, all come back to say this is Catholic faith. And some of those articles are written by Roman Catholic theologians who say the 39 articles are consonant with the Catholic faith. Um, and uh, there are some that, that say, no, 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 they're, they're clearly Protestant. But for the vast majority, it is. Uh, for example, a uh, uh, book by Thomas Rogers, uh, who was uh, writing uh, back in the uh, 18th century. And uh, he says, for example, uh, talking about uh, Article 10 of the Articles of Religion, is what he says it teaches is the Catholic religion teaches free will. It's the Catholic religion. Take that language out, we don't got a monarch. 
even though someone wanted to make George Washington the king, George says, no, that's not right. But basically, the articles state what the church understood at the time that certain controversies were going on. And the point is that the articles of religion actually should be taken in a Catholic sense. That was what was said by all of these people. There's one I want to find here. That, yes. Uh, defense of the uh, 39 articles uh, of the Anglican Church as, as written by a Roman Catholic at Cambridge University in 1694. Interesting. And uh, it's important for us then to understand that in that way. And uh, if, if one wants to understand the Articles of Religion, one of the best books one can go to for that, what I consider to be the absolute best authority, is E.J. McNell's 39 Articles of the Church of England. And it's an excellent book that goes the history, the background, the intent of all the people who were writing those articles, what they did. And it's very clear that what is said is said in a proper Catholic understanding of the faith. Doesn't agree with the Roman Catholic Church all the way because, for example, in the Latin rite, at least in the Roman Church, priests cannot be married. Now, in the other rites, the Eastern rites and so forth in the Roman Church, priests can be married. But uh, uh, in, in the articles of religion say that priests are free to be married or single as they see. But even the Roman Catholic Church would accept that. I have to share with you something in that regard. Years ago, when I was a bishop of Eau Claire, we had a young man at the cathedral who was marrying a young girl from Peru. And she didn't know much English. So the dean of the cathedral was trying to give her some pre-marriage instructions as we're required to do. And uh, she had questions about the church, and he couldn't really communicate, so he came to me, I do speak Spanish, and he said, can you talk to this young lady and explain to her what the church is like, you know, in her language, so she'll understand, because she's coming out of a Roman Catholic background. So she did, she came in and talked to me. And uh, so uh, one of the questions she asked is, how many sacraments do you have? And I talked about the seven sacraments, and the articles of religion list all seven sacraments. Oh, yes, we have seven sacraments too. Do you have monks and nuns? And I said, yes, I talked about some of our religious orders. Oh, that's, that's fine, she said. Uh, what, what differences are there? And I said, well, one, uh, the Roman Catholic Church requires belief in the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and for us, it's the highest opinion. You're permitted to believe, not required to believe. And she said, what else? And I said, well, in the Roman Catholic Church, of course, your clergy, the priests and bishops, are celibate. In the Anglican Communion, priests can be married. And she stopped and grinned and started laughing, and she says, Back home, our priest is married, but the bishop don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it is important to, to, to note that basically, this is something that can be... A, now, you can interpret those articles in a very Protestant way. That's possible. Um, but that's not what was intended. Just like in Article 28, as I went through the finding. After looking at that, which some people said was obviously anti-Catholic, came to the conclusion that when I understood what was being said, neither the Romans nor Anglicans had any trouble with it. I want to talk now just a little bit about the seven ecumenical councils, because this is extremely important. Both in the Constitution and Canons of the Anglican Church of North America, but more than that in the history of the Anglican Communion itself, the seven ecumenical councils have been accepted. And I know of no non-Catholic church that accepts all seven. In fact, a lot of them don't accept any of them. Southern Baptists don't. They might agree with what's being said, but they don't recognize councils. 
I want to share with you then something about Anglicans of the Seven Ecumenical Councils because the Catholic Church, before any divisions in Christianity, church for the first thousand years, the historic, undivided, one holy Catholic and apostolic church, is the one that produced all seven councils. So if you want to go back to the church before any divisions occur, which is what the Lambeth Quarter Lateral calls us to do, then you have to accept the seven ecumenical councils. And there is a problem because some of those, there have been statements made, look, we had a question this morning about what Lancelot Anders said about the four ecumenical councils. Well, the first four deal with a number of things, and they were considered by many to be the most important. And the last three deal with certain other issues, some of which are peripheral, some of which are important. But the, but the fact is, all are accepted. And I just want to share with you some, some information about that. And I'm going to talk here from uh, authorities, primarily from the Episcopal Church, uh, and also the Anglican Communion on a worldwide level. We begin, first of all, with what the Church said in the Chicago Declaration in 1886. The undivided Catholic Church, which is what we're trying to get back to, is the Church of the first thousand years. It was only one Church. During this time, before any divisions, is when the seven ecumenical councils were held. And they were accepted by the whole church, east and west, including England. And this is what the Episcopal Dictionary of the Church says concerning the seven councils. Um, seven councils are recognized as ecumenical by both eastern and western churches. Nicaea 325, which dealt centrally with the divinity of the Logos. Constantinople in 381, which established the formula for expressing the Trinity and dealt with the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Ephesus in 431, which decided against Nestorianism and promulgated the definition of the person of Christ. Uh, and in another place in the first and fourth council of Chalcedon in 451, which defined the union of divine and human natures in Christ, the touchstone of Orthodox Christology. Speaking of the last three councils, the dictionary says Constantinople 2 and 553, Constantinople 3 and 680, 681, and Nicaea 2 and 787 did refining work on the person of Christ in defining the role of images in worship. So, as, as we have read from the documents of the church uh, that we accept, these teachings of the seven ecumenical councils. Because of their crucial role in defining the doctrine of the Trinity and incarnation, Anglicans regard the first four councils as the most important, which goes back to what Lancelot Adams was talking about. The most definitive authority on canon law is the ecclesiastical law of the Church of England by Sir Robert Fillmore, 19th century work. It's about runs about 5,000 pages. <laughs> Believe it or not, I've read it all. In volume two of this work, we read the role given by the Church of England to the first four councils specifically in reference to the authority of the other councils. And this is what Fillmore said. According to our English statute, 1 Elizabeth 1.17, Heresy is to be determined by the authority of the canonical scriptures or by the first four general councils or any of them or by any other general council wherein the same was declared heresy by expressive plain words of said canonical scripture. Having recognized the specific authority of the four councils of Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, and Chalcedon, Philemore goes on to declare recognition of Constantinople II and III and Nicaea. He points out that although Constantinople II and III were composed of bishops of the Eastern Church, they were ratified by bishops of the Western Church, including the Pope. However, he comments, the Gallican, as well as the Anglican Church, has combated the doctrine that 
ratification of the Pope was necessary for the validity of the canons. We recognize it, we said, we don't have to wait for the Pope to approve them, we approve them, and that's it. Francis Paul, in his 10 volume classic work, Dogmatic Theology, in volume 2, declares seven councils have been generally received in the church and are to be reckoned as ecumenical. He also refers to the Elizabethan statute embracing the first four, the second book of homilies, which recognizes councils five and six, and referring to those who dislike the seventh, but nonetheless acknowledge its authority. Uh, the acceptance of the seventh council was delayed in the West, he says. The council of Frankfurt rejected it, apparently because of imperfect translations of its decrees. During the Middle Ages, it gained acceptance everywhere, including England, nor have the Anglican churches taken any negative action since. So yes, we do recognize the seven ecumenical councils. And uh, we've never rejected the seventh council. And specifically, uh, in dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Anglican Communion, has specifically recognized the Seventh Council, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And uh, the problem with the Seventh Ecumenical Council has to do with images, statues and paintings and those sorts of things. Because what it says is, and this, I'm going to have to use some Greek terms here, that you give honor to people. And the Greek word for that is Julia. And to the Blessed Virgin Mary, as the mother of Christ, you give the highest honor, hyperdulia. But only to God do you give worship, which is matria. And notice the trouble is that dulia and latria have totally different meanings. But when you translate it from Greek into Latin, it's the same word. And it looks like you're saying we worship images. No. How many of you respect George Washington? A great person. A president of the United States. Not the first president, but the first president of the Constitution. John Hanson was the first president. But George Washington is called the father of the country, isn't he? He led our troops to victory against the British. He helped establish the Constitution. He served as the first president of the Constitution. And I don't know what goes on now, but when I was growing up, there was a picture of George Washington in every classroom and every school in the country. And his birthday was a national holiday. We give to him honor. We give to him praise. We give to him latria. Which the seventh ecumenical council says is appropriate both to the person and to the picture. We do not give, well, we give, I'm sorry, no, 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 dulia. Latria is, is worship. We give to him dulia. We cannot give to him latria. Praise and worship, because to do so would be to worship something other than God. And so there were a lot of people who thought that the Seventh Ecumenical Council called for us to worship saints, or to worship statues, or to worship things other than God. And that's probably why the German council didn't accept the Seventh Ecumenical Council because they got it in Latin, not in Greek. Uh, but idolatry, the worship of something other than God, is condemned in the Second of the Ten Commandments. It's condemned in the Articles of Religion. It is condemned in Holy Scripture. And it's that whole confusion of language that causes the problem there. Article 22 does condemn the giving of worship to something other than God, but that does not condemn what the Seventh Ecumenical Council calls for. And finally, in the 20th century, in dealing with the Orthodox Church, 
we came to a, an agreement in that says, yes, we understand what's being said in the Seventh Ecumenical Council, and we accept it. And so that's something that we need to understand about the Seventh Ecumenical Councils, that they do, in fact, uh, have an authority and an acceptance for the whole Anglican community in, in everything that uh, we understand, even, as I say, in the Constitution and canons of the Anglican Church in North America, and certainly in the understanding of, of the Church of England. When I talk about canons then, I say we have to look at the canons of the church. A canon is simply a rule. In fact, the word canon in Greek means a rule, a measure. So when we talk about canons, those are simply the rules by which the church functions. And they can be changed, but the canons reflect uh, the understanding of the Catholic faith. For example, if you read the canons of the Anglican Church of North America, or the Episcopal Church, or the Anglican Church of Canada, or the Church of England, or any of them, you read the canons and the rubrics, the prayer book, and everything, you will see that when a bishop is consecrated, for example, he must be consecrated by at least three bishops. Where does that come from? The Council of Nicaea, the first general council of the church, first ecumenical council, in 325 A.D. says to make sure that you're not just kind of on the edge there, but that this is part of the action of the church, for a bishop to be consecrated in a province, a majority of the provincial bishops must agree to it, and at least three bishops must be present to take part in the consecration. Uh, I'm not going to go into the question, well, for whatever reason you only have two, is it an imbalance? There's some evidence that would say, no, it's irregular, but permissible. But the canons then that we have here go back to the first ecumenical council. And now some of the canons are simply uh, organizational. You know, in the United States, uh, local congregations are governed by vestries. And that's spelled out. And the vestry will consist you know, of a senior warden, a junior warden, and other vestry members. And generally, those vestries are elected by the congregation at an annual meeting. Now, in some places, it's provided that the senior warden is called the priest warden, is appointed by the priest, and the junior warden, the people's warden, is elected by the congregation. That's not universal, but that's a pattern. In England, it's a little different because you have some laws of parliament that regulate the function of your parish vestries or councils there. But the point is, these are administrative, they're not dogma. You don't have to have a senior ward. You can still be a congregation without a senior ward. You have to be careful. Uh, you don't want the priest running everything, but uh, there, there is this idea spelled out in the canons, this is for operation and discipline. It's not a matter of doctrine. But there are also in, in the canons provisions, for example, for what happens when you have a priest who is doing bad things. Now the articles of religion say the personal unworthiness, sinfulness of the priest does not affect the sacrament's validity. If a very corrupt, evil priest baptizes you, you're still a baptized Christian. But it is the responsibility of the church to deal with and uh, to uh, discipline clergy who are violating their oath, their vows, and the belief of the church. And uh, you, have, you have to be careful, but the point is, you can have clergy who teach heresy. And the trouble is, you can have clergy who teach heresy that the church doesn't pay any attention to. And what do you get out of that? You get Christians who've been defrauded of part of the faith. So the articles of religion, the canons of the church, and Holy Scripture all tell us 
We need to deal with these sorts of things. And the canon spell out how we deal with them. And that's true for both Anglicans and Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. Now, if you look at the canons of these three different bodies, you'll find many similarities and you'll find a lot of differences too. In the Roman Catholic Church, there's one code of canon law that applies to the whole church. If you look at the Eastern Orthodox, you have a collection of canons called the Rudder, uh, which is a big, big book, but it looks like someone just made up a big stew and then dumped it into a pot. Uh, the Eastern mind is not as definitive as the Western mind in that regard. But it's all there, you just have to learn how to find it. If you look at the Anglican Communion, you'll see that each province has its own constitution and canons. But if you look, they're all tied together and there is a commonality. And there has been a wonderful work done by a canon law scholar by the name of Roe, who has put out canon law in the Anglican Communion. And it takes what each province does and says and shows how it's all, even though they're different, sort of like the Orthodox difference, it all is the same pattern and all fits together. But the point is, whether it's Roman or Anglican or Orthodox, you will find basically the same things there, the, the same sense of the unity and continuity of the church. And then, last, I want us to look at what I call documents, agreements that are made, concordats, dialogue agreements and so forth that kind of spell out where the church is. We have, for example, at the international level, there are a series of Anglican Roman Catholic agreements, the so-called Archic documents. And generally, once the document is agreed to by either side, it's simply a statement of what the people who worked on it agreed to. But in the case of the first Archic documents, one and two in particular, it was requested that they be looked at and ratified by the churches. And what the Anglican Communion did is they took those agreements and they sent them out to all the provinces and said, we want you to study them and come back in 1988 and again in 1998 to Latin Conference and say whether or not you agree with what these documents say. And by 1998, the Anglican Communion had agreed to the Archie documents and say this is a statement of what we understand the Christian faith to be. And Lambeth Conference then passed a resolution approving that on the basis of what the provinces had done. And that was sent to Rome. Um, the Roman Church has not completed that process yet, but we are told that while things move slowly, they do move. And it's sort of like what one of our Eastern Orthodox priests said, yes, the church moves slowly, maybe a thousand years and we'll get it done. But we do have those parking documents there. We then have dialogue agreements with the Orthodox on a number of things. And those have been agreed at the highest level. So we have international agreements. We also have international agreements with other churches on certain things. Now, I mentioned this morning the, the Lima Declaration, um, and I can uh, add to that some of the agreements we have, not just with the bond agreement with the old Catholics, but also dialogue agreements with the Lutherans on certain points, with the Methodists on certain points. But in all these things, what we have then are ecumenical statements which define our understanding of, as well as uh, adherence to Catholic practice. So that as we look at all of these things, we can come to the conclusion that yes, Catholicity is the universal truth of Christian faith as understood by the undivided church and as held for the last 2,000 years. And that is also the faith of the Anglican Communion. So we can say, 
in that. We, we have to say yes. Now, what if you say, oh, well, Catholic means Roman Catholic, and that means you have to accept the Pope. Don't ever say that to a Greek. <laughs> and say, we don't care about those Italians. Of course, the present Pope is not an Italian, although his parents were. He was born in Argentina. But uh, Catholic does not mean simply the patriarchy of the West. It means the whole church. And it means sometimes dealing with Christians you hardly ever think about. For example, what's the principal church in Egypt? <coughs> the Coptic church. And it's been there 2,000 years. It's still persecuted. And in the rise of Islam, the Muslims killed thousands of Christian priests in Egypt and laity too, and they're still doing it. But the church has been there for 2,000 years. Alexandria is one of the five patriarchies of the church. Uh, and it is also uh, the head of the uh, Coptic Church. The, the uh, Archbishop of Alexandria is actually his title, the Coptic title. He's the Pope of Alexandria. Well, the trouble is, the word Pope doesn't mean Bishop of Rome, it means Father, Papa, the Papa, the Pope, the Father. So in a sense, anyone who is a male parent is a Pope. Everyone who is a, a, a Bishop in the Church uh, is a Pope. But the Bishop of Rome is the Bishop of Rome, the Archbishop of Italy, and the Patriarch of Europe. Those are his proper titles. And we go back, the Church of England doesn't deny that, recognizes it, recognizes that he's the head of the great Latin Church of the West and says the Bishop of Rome has no more authority in this realm than any other bishop. So there we are. I don't have any authority in England. That's what they're saying. Let me stop at that point because we've covered all this and 